so this book seeks to uh, re-engage our musical culture, our musical consciousness um, with the sacred, with an engagement with theology. There's a tendency, I think, in our musical conservatoires and musical department to treat music as purely abstract, as a notes on the page. So what we did is we invited composers, almost 100 composers invited, to, um, to um, be part of a scheme, a theoretry scheme, um, where they uh, were mentored by Sir James Macmillan and they worked with six theologians um, in our institute to create six new pieces of music based on enunciations in the Old Testament, six passages of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible which um, concerned the encounter of God with humankind. And so this, the book is in three parts and it kind of charts uh, this collaboration. So in the first part we have um, compositional and theological perspectives. So Sir James Macmillan and Paul Miller reflect on how their own Christian faith has profoundly inspired and informed their own music. There's a couple of perspectives about the practical nature of writing um, sacred music, what makes it easy, what makes it um, uh, enjoyable for um, uh, choirs to perform, as well as perspectives from um, biblical studies and church history on interpreting scripture. And then the heart, the central part of the book, are these six collaborations. So the theologians talk about their research on particular episodes of the Bible, the composers share their reflections on the collaboration, and then most excitingly, and this is why I was so glad to be able to work with Open Book Publishers on this volume, you can then read the musical score and hear a performance of the musical score while you're looking at it um, uh, um, in that second part of the book. And there's also beautiful illustrations and lots of images. So it really kind of explodes with colour in the centre of the book. But then we have to ask, well, who's going to listen to this music? What's, what's going to happen to this music next? What's the future of sacred music? And so in the third part of the volume, we've got persp perspectives from practitioners in the Anglican Church and the Catholic Church. We've got a wonderful chapter on sacred music in secular spaces. Sacred music has exploded at the moment um, uh, across the world. It's not limited to churches or cathedrals. People are listening it to on their, on their, on their uh, iPad. Um, they're listening um, to it on their phone. It's, it's out there. So we've got that uh, as well. And then finally, um, a chapter by one of my colleagues, uh, Gavin Hobbs, on the listener share, on thinking about uh, what it means to listen to sacred music. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really, really um, exciting volume, which hopefully um, captures something of, of the journey of this um, collaborative project. Oh, well, I think um, Annunciations is something new because, um, as I've said, um, when composers um, write music at the moment, when they study music, it's about the notes on the page. It's about the craft of composition. And what we've really tried to say is, hang on a sec, composers in the past, they've been inspired by the extra musical. That might not necessarily be religion, but it's been collaboration with poets, with librettists, with stuff coming outside the notes on the page. And I think what this volume shows is how by collaborating with others, in our case with theologians, it ignites the creative process. It leads to really um, interesting and dynamic new music. And I think what each of the six composers would, would say, and, and each of their six compositions is very different, strikingly different, is that the particular musical language, the particular kind of effects they've created, they wouldn't have conceived them without trying to um, uh, respond to the inspiration in the uh, in the, the scriptures that they're working for. I mean, so just one example, um, that one, one of the pieces, Exodus 3, is about Moses' encounter with the burning bush. And the theologian was saying, well, usually we think of that as a visual image, but then immediately when you're thinking about that in sound, well, what does the burning bush sound like? And what does it mean? And why did God choose to identify himself in this way with fire? And, and so that then led to this beautiful organ writing that you hear in Carenza's piece, um, and also thinking about, well, how does God's voice, what does God's voice sound like? How does it come out of the flame? And trying to capture that, you don't capture in words, but how to capture that in sound, well, that leads to really interesting and uh, new, very original new music. So, um, yeah. Um, 
I think probably, I mean, my grandfather always said to be open to surprises. And I think um, for a composer, often you can be very nervous about collaborating with others. Um, uh, but what they've discovered, what we've discovered through the collaborations is that by opening yourself to others, by opening yourself to collaboration, by opening yourself to surprises, um, all sorts of interesting things happen. And one of the real innovations, I think, of our, our project is that by approaching these very well-known episodes in the Bible through a new lens, thinking about them for the theologians as well, imaginatively as informing new pieces of music, it's actually provided new interpretations, new perspectives uh, for biblical scholars as well on these, these passages. Um, so I think, um, yes, for the collaborators, and there are 23 contributors to this volume, it's a very big volume, but I think hopefully also for our readers, we'd hope that they would also be open to surprises, that by looking at um, well-known scriptural passages in a different way through the artistic imagination in relation to music, um, you'll find new things and discover new things. Yeah. Uh, the most challenging thing, um, I think the most challenging thing about the volume has also been the, the most interesting. It really has been a huge collaboration. So we have this Institute for Theology, Imagination, the Arts in the University of St. Andrews School of Divinity. Um, but we've been collaborating with the whole team in music, with St. Salvador's Chapel Choir, um, uh, bringing lots of different people together from different backgrounds, uh, with different kinds of formation. And that's challenging because they have different preconceptions, but it's also very exciting when, um, say, a theologian who's been studying in depth the, um, uh, the biblical narrative, who's dealing with the absolute details of the Hebrew language, is then encountering a composer who maybe hasn't even read the Bible at all, or whose only experience of the Bible is Christmas and Easter, and but has all this depth of um, experience of musical language and imagination. And you put those two people together, and um, that's a challenge for both of them, but I think it's also been uh, uh, rewarding and exciting for them. And, and seeing that come together has, has, been, has been really fulfilling. always been there with scriptural exegesis from the beginning. Um, I mean, in terms of our Western core tradition, you think of Gregorian chant being there, right, in, in the earliest stage, that in a sense, um, the, the revelation in, in the Bible has always pushed beyond the boundaries of the word alone. Um, and uh, we're very pleased, even the cover of the volume, you see a front piece of a choir book, and there you've got the most beautiful image of the Annunciation, you've got the, the music, uh, and then you've got the words. Uh, there's a sense that um, uh, the music can draw something out which you can't get with the wor words alone. And the Bible is obviously, particularly the passage we've looked at, um, full of the, the deepest human desires, the most terrible human suffering and tragedy, and also the human uh, attempt to connect with the divine. And I think in those three areas in particular, the word is never going to be enough. And so music um, uh, can work with the text in, in really exciting ways.